So this is Stu and I at Purple Valley with Tim Field. Yeah, can we start again? <laughs> <laughs> These foreign Tim names. Fee you can call me Tim Field the whole Fee afternoon. Fee Fee this is Stu at Purple Valley with Tim Field. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Field. <laughs> Let's start again. God yeah, sake. Start. Ever the professional. Hi, this is Stu at Purple Valley and I'm here with Kino and Tim Feldman. And they are uh, like one of the premier sort of yoga couples, shall we say, both teaching. Um, so those are the sort of questions I wanted to ask you about first. What is it like? You obviously teach separately around the world at different times, but then you come together and teach. Is that uh, present more challenges to when you're teaching separately, or, or does it give you a great new sense of energy when you come together and teach? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it too. Do you, do you find that there is certain things about maybe the way one of you teaches and the way that the other doesn't, that then you need to have like a, a pre-arrangement as to how you're going to teach certain things or do you just do your own thing in the shala? How does it work? Well, we've been teaching together for years now, really. <coughs> Almost 10 years. So it's very organic, I would say, like <coughs> the way that I teach and when Kino is there, I just tend to just leave a little more space. Like before I jump in and do something, I just like step one step back and try to figure out if now is the time for fixing and now is the time to just listen just a tad more before I jump, in, jump yeah. into fixing. And I mean, I would also probably say that I've learned so much from teaching with Tim that um, especially when we first started, so much of my information about anatomy and my information about um, how to approach the body from an anatomical perspective has really come from Tim. And I've learned yeah. so much from teaching together with him that it's just really great to be able to see how his gift of sharing anatomy and an inner approach to working from the body and the working from the subtle body really impacts the students. And because our interests lie in different ways, when I'm teaching together with him, it's really good for me to be able to see almost which <coughs> students need more of his approach and be able to really just uh, sort of uh, like watch that happen. Yeah. And do you, do you deliberately say, okay, we've got this group of 30, 40 people or whatever, and say, Tim, you start working with the person in Capitassan or, or whatever. Would you then say, okay, over the course of that week, I'll let Tim mostly work with that person in Capitassan and I'll maybe work mostly on this, or do you just, whoever is nearest at the time, because maybe your approaches are slightly different, or how do you work it? So when we are in the uh, teaching situation, um, I think at first it's kind of organic. We try to figure out where to go and where we don't go. Sometimes we speak a little bit about, I'll say, Kino, why don't you work with this guy? Because uh, he needs some of that stuff that you are, you, you are doing. Yeah. I think you could help him at this moment. And um, so there's that. Sometimes we do things like that. And at other times, it's also just like if Kino is working on somebody, yeah. I don't go there. Yeah. Like if Kino goes over and works on somebody in Nikapara, uh, Asana on Monday, I don't go there on Monday and work on that posture. Yeah. So he gets one message yeah. that day. Next day I might go, but then I will go and continue from what, hopefully continue from what Kino s spoke about the day before. So continue that theme rather continue than change that, direction. Mm -hmm. Rather yeah. than like change right. to another focus yeah. on that yeah. same thing. At least I think that is what we would like to do. Do we always succeed? <laughs> it's probably questionable. Yeah. But we, this is w what we what we try, it seems to be most useful for the yeah. student. And do you have, is there any one posture that you found through your own experimentation that this particular style of approach, this asana works for me, but it wouldn't work for your body and vice mm. versa, or, or mm. you've come up with something. I know sometimes like for instance, the what should be happening is about the rotation once you're in say Janusha <coughs> Chasana uh, A, uh, the hip, some people think it should be immediately rotating. Some people should think it should mm. be externally rotating. Is there any postures where you have mm. a, a dramatic shift change apart from your approach? You're fairly unified by I the looks of it, so. isn't it? I think so. I mean, because I don't, like for me personally, I think that when I first started teaching, 
And maybe when we first met, I was much more interested in like having the definitive answer. Right. And one of the things that I think I've definitely learned from practice, from being married together with you for a long time, and also just teaching is that there's not a definitive answer to anything. Yeah. And so maybe in one case, one anatomical piece of information is right for one student. And then maybe in another case, it's right for a, diff a th completely different yeah. direction is right for a different student. So I'm not really interested in finding the definitive answer, but instead sort of remaining open to the possibility of what's appropriate for each student based yeah. on that, that moment in time and being open to the idea that that might change. So that sort of attitude, I think, creates um, you know, more space for the coexistence of divergent opinions and yeah. mutual respect around that. Yeah, yeah. And because you've both got dramatically different bodies and body yeah. shapes and underlying structures. So I think that's quite refreshing to see for a lot of people because we get into this idea that there's a, a perfect yoga body type yeah. that is going to be able to do this, 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 sure. and, and everybody else can't, can't do it. Yeah. Um, but you guys are like at the, not the extremes, but you have yeah. definitely, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. bodies that are maybe outside of that normal window, shall right. we say, that people conjure up in their head. Yeah. Mm. And so that's really great for people to look at and right. see. And, and do you find that then things crop up and maybe do you talk to each other when you're having trouble with certain postures or where would you go say tim where would you go if you were working on a posture and and having trouble with it would you come to Kino over the dinner table and say you know this da -da -da yeah. posture you got any ideas for me yeah all the time yeah i think <clears throat> you know like the postures i can do the postures i can do the postures i'm working on like it's it's one big mix like there's always another level in any asana whether yeah. it's the most e the most simple asana or the more uh, difficult asana there's always another level uh, also in regards to what you were asking before like there's no there's as Kino mentioned there's no one way uh, yeah. there's no one thing that one asana suits it's like it can suit a number of different things depends depending on which phase you are in in your process as a yeah. human being and as an asana practitioner but yeah so <clears throat> from my uh, own experience like i would be working on something and then if i have a little question i'll be flying that by kino and saying what do you do here do you actually do this or do you do that whether it's in my own practice or whether it's with with students um, like i will come home and i'll have some situation with a student i feel i wouldn't be able to really solve or like that has puzzled yeah. me in, in some yeah. way are there times that are off limits you know is it like because yoga can pervade every hour of your life if you yeah. let it can't you so yeah. if you say like okay this is downtime we're not going to mm. do yoga we're not going to talk about yoga we just mm. we need yeah. to have other things going on i think oh. mostly in my soul yeah, yeah. so like that's time for yourselves yet yeah, there like uh, you like to talk asana a lot down on the coconuts after practice, and, yeah. after practice. <laughs> and i don't yeah <clears throat> so usually we meet up with a couple of people and depending on who it is yeah. i'll sit more to the left <laughs> or a little bit closer to the center <laughs> there and do you have different things that you want out of the practice so okay you're a couple mm. and you're both doing ashtanga but we can do it for many different reasons and many different things that we want out of the physical practice or the other elements do you do you have a difference between the two of you as to what you want out of it mm. i think in that relation like <clears throat> now now you are extremely strong but at, at that time when we first met you were not so strong you were no. very flexible not very strong and I think that somehow that has carried on with you, you know, that you're very interested in that strength aspect. Mm -hmm. you, you get a lot of out of that. That yeah. is really an inspiring part for you. And for me, not so much. I would almost say like, for me, the, what I struggle more with in my practice is the flexibility part. So right. I got to be careful how much strength I work. Yeah. So I like back off a little bit on, on strength. So for instance, like jump throws, I'm not yeah. too worried about them. I cannot jump through the way I feel I need to do to um, cultivate a, some particular physical neurological patterns which I think is important yeah. and I'll keep that at this kind of like base level because if I start to push that too much first of all that's strenuous and I'm just getting too old to care <laughs> and second of all um, I th if I push too much into f to strength stuff I lose yeah. my flexibility stuff yeah. and I'm stiff enough to not being able to allow myself that yeah. does that make sense 
And then for Kino, for you, you like, I uh, gather from seeing you mm -hmm. practice on that, you like the transitions and the jumps and, and that sort of stuff and the strength. Yeah. And, and what is it that you get out of doing that side of things? For me, the journey of any asana is the journey of what it represents to yeah. like the inner journey. And so for me, like I wasn't strong at all when I first started the practice. I couldn't balance a headstand. I couldn't lift my butt off the ground to save my life at all. I wasn't naturally strong. I don't think I'd ever did a push up before I came to the Ashtanga yoga method. Right. And so for me, it was like every time that I came up to a major obstacle in my practice, the journey of meeting that obstacle every single day of my practice and then slowly uh, sort of surpassing that really set me on the idea of mental strength and mental endurance. So the idea that you can be strong, not just physically, but that you can be strong at every moment of your life. Right. Yeah. And so for me, when I when I work on strength, it's about creating like solid mental, emotional, psychological boundaries. It's about being able to take care of myself emotionally. And, and it's about standing up for myself in the world rather than putting that demand on someone else yeah. and then demanding that, uh, you know, someone else is, is responsible for me or takes care of me. It's, it's about really learning how to stand on my own two feet um, and literally to have a backbone rather than just to sort of flop around all of the time. Right. So, for so me you it's take that direct translation mm -hmm. off the mat. Absolutely. Into Real and so, I mean, and also for me, like, if I don't work on strength, I, yeah. it goes away right away. Does it go quickly for you? Very quickly. It goes completely away and the, like, my bone structure loses its stability. So it's like, I have to work on that consistently. Um, I have to maintain mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Otherwise, like, it'll, it just starts to deteriorate and I feel less and less stability in my joints, which means that I actually end up having pain in my joints and, yeah. um, you know, I feel that they get unstable. And so, how would you? I, yeah, go for Tim. Like so, I think that is really interesting what Keener's talking about there, and I, I really respect what she's saying, and that um, <coughs> connection between the inner and the outer asana, yeah. the inner and the outer breath, the inner and the outer um, boon of the asana, so to speak. Um, like one thing that is has been important for me, um, and what I've seen living in America, yeah. is that there is. A contemporary movement that is working on empowerment right. the empowerment movement which I think is really off the mark uh, honestly and I think that sometimes that uh, we have these discussions sometimes where I think that the, the possibility of um, making it an empowerment training rather than a true uh, um, spiritual uh, quest yeah. if I may go that mm -hmm. far, is uh, a very fine line. And I feel that sometimes that these things are being taught as empowerment, as it's good, you know, because you get to love yourself and you get to yeah. know yourself and you get to feel strong and a capable person in the world. Um, and where, in my opinion, like the empowerment movement is sitting in and strengthening that part of ourselves which exactly needs to be unstrengthened which is the ahamkara the ashmita the the eyeness the the the, the ego the part of us that says this is who i am yeah. and the one that potentially uh, lacks some self-confidence but you boost that part and it backfires in yeah. my my opinion so you get these like mm -hmm. uh, you stiffen up the ego right. and there is no um, connection that becomes less connection to who we really are and uh, to taking a humble and um, uh, honest uh, reality check of who we are. Yeah. So we speak about that sometimes and so I'm a little bit and that is my entry into why I don't enjoy very much to teach handstands, to show handstands on yeah. public media, to uh, do all these kind of things, because I feel that it goes into that part of, part of co contemporary society. And that's a part that I would like to just soften a little bit as much as I yeah. can at all. And you both have quite a dramatic difference in your approach to social media mm. and that type of thing, mm. um, obviously deliberately. Mm. And so, Kino, for you, how does it work for you as far as you ha have more of a high profile mm -hmm. aspect and en enjoy that side of it? Yeah. So how do you feel that that helps? I mean, I know for myself that you've got some like fantastically instructional videos mm -hmm. out there which people can draw on and you're sharing so much information. Some people might say, you know, you're out there too much. But 
for me, you've given a lot. You know, you've given so much information out there for for nothing as as such. Whereas some other teachers almost hold on to their little jewels and well I use this for my workshops and I use this and that and don't want to give away mm. any secrets right so uh, how does it work for you how do you approach the whole thing of being out there more but in relation to like giving away your knowledge or being yeah. generous with that like nothing is ours anyway I don't no. really believe mm. that it's ours mm. you know um, any piece of insight that might come through me like I didn't invent that I I, I either like got that from someone else, I copied it from Tim when I was listening to him, or I found it. If it was an inspired moment, it wasn't me. It was, you know, um, like we all have, I think, the ability to, to tap into true inspiration, you know, and, and that's rare. And if in moments that that happens, I don't think that's ours. Like yeah. we don't own any of the knowledge, like all of the knowledge is God's. So yeah. if we have it, it's ours to share, if mm. anything else. Yeah. It's not ours to keep. That would be greed, which is pretty much against the Yoga Sutras, yeah. you know, which is pretty much the opposite of why we got the knowledge in the first place. So if you have it, I think you have it to share. Yeah. But if you say you get some time off, yeah. and then mm. when, I, when I'm not working, I get time off. I, my wife also practices Ashtanga, and mm -hmm. I love to practice with her. I get mm. a real energy from practicing together, and it brings us close. And but for yourselves, what if you have some particular time off, mm -hmm. would you choose to practice at the same time or how do you work your schedules and, and or would you prefer to practice separately? How does it work for you guys? I think if we have time off, we both love to sleep in. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably the number one thing we both like. Mm -hmm. Neither of us likes to get up early. Except we have a cat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and that's the cat you're around in. six o'clock is going <laughs> meow, meow. Yeah. And I'm usually the cat feeder, <laughs> so I wake He's up a around that time. <laughs> That's your designated <laughs> job, is it? But it, yes, it's, it's very nice. So usually I wake up a little bit before Kino, at least these years, and uh, yeah. go down, feed the cat. And But she's still the first one on the mat. <laughs> like I'm still, I'm sitting down there with an extra cup of coffee, you know, and whatever I'm doing. And uh, she gets on the mat usually before me. Sometimes yeah. we overlap. Sometimes I. I go in <coughs> and practice after after Kino, but it's very interesting. Uh, we we used to practice together mm -hmm. for a while, and we still do sometimes, but we never set a time. We so never, you never do it on purpose. Okay, we're going to practice at this oh. time or whatever. Rarely, rarely. Yeah, Maybe if we're on vacation and we are like in a hotel somewhere. And we know we have an appointment to be yeah, at. Yeah, that you've got to both be finished your yeah. practice by. X then time. we end up practicing on the same okay. time. Then, mm -hmm. But like, if I can tell one foreign story about that. So <laughs> some years ago, I was. Um, uh, in a bit of a rot with my practice and I didn't want to get on my mat yeah. and I was like I don't want to do it and all that and then I asked uh, one of my teachers uh, Nara Simhan uh, from Mysore who is an extremely knowledgeable man, knowledgeable man in many ways and I said to him Nara Simhan uh, can I ask you a very strange question he said of course so I asked him I don't want to get on my mat he's like can you tell me do you have any advice for me and he went hmm he said, has anyone been practicing in the room before you? I said, yeah, usually as a matter of fact, yes, someone has been practicing in there. He said, then this is what you do. You play some chanting. You put a tape recorder or something like this in the, not a tape recorder, but what's it called? Like a yeah, CD. iPod. iPod, CD yeah. player, something like that, right? In the room before you practice with some chanting. And then after about 10 minutes, then you go in and practice. You see how that works. I thought, that's a really funky advice, right? And I thought, I'll do that. So I would put my computer with J.S. Ree, his, mm -hmm. uh, um, his cousin, uh, chanting in there in the room before I went in. And that, went, that w worked totally for me. I cannot explain anything else, but I think it's like clearing the energy. And I think coming back to the similarity and the differences between Q and I, I think we practice very differently. Yeah. And I think maybe, who knows, maybe the energy that Kino left in the room was just at a different vibration, mm -hmm. a level or something, well, you know what I mean? Then and what, support what your practice, supported yeah. me getting onto that man. Yeah. So, yeah, right. I get that. And do you, uh, what about for yourself, Kino, when if, I was sort of, is Tim a, Tim a bit sluggish <laughs> for well. you to have him practicing next year? You can be truthful here. Well, I think the thing that comes up when we practice uh, together, and this has actually happened here at Purple Valley a couple of times, yeah. we, then we practice together here because we're finished. Because you've only got that time, And we finished window. teaching at the same time, yeah. we practice together. But one time we came here after like, I don't know, two months in Mysore, and mm. I had just learned part of fourth series, this yeah. like this really challenging part of fourth series, really, really hard for me. If there was one posture that broke me, like these were the postures 
right in the middle of forcers. They're terrible. And I remember right when I started to do them, Tim sort of said, hey, I've got an idea for how to change the baseboards at home or something like this. And I thought, no, please, not now. And then and I, said, I literally said, just 10 minutes, please. And then as soon as I was done with the postures, yeah. he actually said, are you done now? Can I say it? <laughs> and then I thought, OK. And the next day, I set up like diagonally across the room from him. As far as you could go, yeah, right? Yeah, but then he yelled across the room. Yeah. <laughs> Still possible. <laughs> So you're just a big distraction to <laughs> you're a disaster. <laughs> yes. But now we set up some clear, you know, I, I can say, please not now. Yeah. You know, and then it's OK. Yeah, I guess I'm a bit more chatty. You're more chatty. But after we, <coughs> for when recently Tim came back from two months in Mysore and then he was removing himself from me because he and I said, what did I, am I doing something? And Tim, you actually said, no, I just know if you're there, I'm going to talk to you. So I'm going into the <laughs> other room. If you want another room, close the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you wanted to isolate yourself. Yeah. 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 Well, we practiced, we practiced together in Mysore last year. And I was so impressed. We were actually practicing exactly next to each other. Mm. But we didn't say a word. So uh, uh, the Sharat had yeah. enforced some But it's true. Thing. Sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult not to talk for me when I practice. Yeah. <coughs> like I feel you go into this. Uh, um, uh, practice space, this kind, of, and you you enter a place where there's space in your brain again, where you the normal um, uh, movements, the normal like continuation of your mind, it starts to slow a little bit, and then there's like some spaces in between where new thoughts pop up, and sometimes a new new thought is like, oh, I know how to join the baseboards in the corner over around the kitchen. You know, sometimes it's yeah. as uh, trivial as that. And uh, when that happens, it feels like little revelation, you know. <laughs> so it's like I gotta tell the world that stuff. You know? but, Isn't but that the chatter we're meant to be keeping out? <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> like you're supposed to like go like, yeah, that's a really great idea. Let's keep that for later. But, yeah. You know, sometimes but it, there's but less it, of a yogi. Yeah. But I will say that when I first started the practice, like I was super serious. Like I was kind of like, you know, really serious. I took it all yeah. really, really seriously. And one of the things I love about you, Tim, is your humor. Like mm. Tim has an amazing sense of humor. Yeah. And I was so serious. And if you had talked to me before, I would kind of be like, oh, mm. someone's talking during the practice. Mm. But, you know, eventually uh, I have surrendered. Obviously, you definitely have your own presences in the shala. And that then becomes a combined presence, too. But there is this feeling of um, strictness. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the way it's going to be done. And mm -hmm. maybe we'll talk in a sec about that as well. Mm -hmm. But also there's a softness and there's a humor, mm -hmm. but at the same time keeping control of the space. Mm -hmm. And that is makes it nice and refreshing without feeling like you're in a boot camp. Mm -hmm. Even, th But it also somehow instills a really hard work ethic right. within the practice. Thank you. So it's like, yeah. I think <coughs> if um, what I enjoy a lot about the Mysore room um, is that if you work with committed people, people that has already made the commitment before they get on the mat, yeah. you work with people who is, whether you're not, whether you, you're there or not, they're going to do it. Then you can approach very gently and very softly and very um, suggestively rather than militant. Now, if you work with people who, who don't want to be on the mat, then you need to set the structure very mm -hmm. clearly. You yeah. need to say, no, you must do this and you must do that. So that's there's that base layer where you have to at first help people find the discipline and in that period in that phase you gotta be that outside authority that keeps them on the mat but then later on you can just wean off that and yeah. for me that's where it starts to be really interesting because you can have very delicate encounters with people that is uh, very special in a very, s um, yeah, maybe delicate, a very gentle yeah. encounters with people uh, where things get across almost with no friction. Mm -hmm. I love that moment very yeah. much. I think you're so talented in the Mysore room in that way. Mm. I mean, I really think just in terms of like our different styles, I feel yeah. like um, between mm. the two of us, you know, Tim t takes people to places inside of the practice um, that are so deep, probably deeper than almost really anyone else can get them. And in a way so that, you know, it's it's simultaneously trusting and simultaneously really um, precise in terms yeah. of anatomically where it's going, but in terms of creating this sort of space of trust. And because Tim, mm. you're so strong and at the same time, you're so knowledgeable at where the body goes that he can do really amazing truly gifted things in the Mysore room yeah um, and things that I could never do um, you know 
because of, you know, I, I don't know if that's my main gifts. And I just, I love to see that in students. There's definitely, you know, the way that you take some people in and backbend or subsukramasana or kapotasana, these sort of things, it's amazing. And I love to see that. And, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's really, really amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've had my own experience practicing with you guys this week with, with kapotasana, you yeah. know, as we brought it up. And it's like, <laughs> Tim says, you know, after a couple of days, just call me over, you know, when you get there. And I'm thinking, it's a little bit like calling somebody over to pull out your fingernails or something <laughs> right. like that because <laughs> it was like so intense for me. But at the same time, a very safe, like you were saying. Right. It's very knowledgeable adjustment, mm. but super intense but, and, and relied more on me uh, surrendering. It was more of a mental thing right. than it was a physical challenge, I think. So, mm. and then of course, when you guys, when Kino, when you arrived and you teamed up as like a tag team, that was like mm. super good too. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely uh, instilling that level of trust um, and and the, the knowledge that you have in that fine tuning of the adjustments for the individual, I think is like really, and things yeah, very good. I mean, and the physical things? strength too, just to get people yeah. in. Like yeah, there's sometimes exactly. when like, I've gotten to help people, we've been teaching together and there's this big guy and I know it needs to be done. And mm. I go and I put like 100% of my effort. I, I walk out with like back pain myself. I hobble around the room for five minutes and Tim's like, did you get his feet to cross? <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no, I got to sit down for five minutes. And then I watched Tim do it the next day and he's there, his feet are crossed and the hands are brown. I'm like, wow, well, I'm, I think you should help him every day. <laughs> you know? But thank you, Kino, for your uh, flattering <coughs> little uh, paragraph there. Uh, I think <laughs> like... <laughs> my sales pitch. Uh, yeah, the sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think like uh, to come back maybe to the first question of today, I think that w for me working with Kino in the space is very effortless, very seamless, very, uh, very comfortable. I feel that I can at any time sit down, spend more time with one student because she'll have the room. Yeah. I don't need to like look over my shoulder. I don't need to keep the overview in the same way as when I'm in, when I'm uh, teaching by myself yeah. and, and so forth. So, and some of all those nice things that Kino just said <coughs> about me, I is like totally mutual. Yeah, I have a infinite trust in the way that, that Kino goes in and does things. Even sometimes she will do stuff and I go, are you sure? And then you will succeed on it every way. And I'm like, I could never pull that sh like what? shit off. <laughs> like what? I don't know. <laughs> it's nothing to do with cooking or anything. Is it like yeah, that? No, like in like just in the like the way that you approach uh, a, a student or a class mm. or a mm. particular moment or mm. an assist or something like that. Yeah. And uh, that approach, you mentioned it briefly this morning in the uh, uh, chat through, you, you are very much in favor of the traditional approach as far as Patabi Joyce, the, the sticking at those key postures in, a, in or, or more simple postures, so we mm -hmm. say that build up to the more complex postures rather than skipping around them or hopping over them if you meet that restriction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Considering as well, that you have, we said, very different bodies and, mm. and many other people have even more different bodies. There's, mm. there's a sort of a movement as well that, mm. okay, not everybody will do everything. Mm. And if you get stuck in a certain place, then uh, you could be there forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so maybe it would suit your body to actually explore some of the things that you can do. Mm -hmm. But obviously, uh, perhaps you could explain as well from both sides why you feel it's important for people not to, shall we say, cheat too quickly or however mm -hmm. you want to put it, hop mm -hmm. around their obstacles. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to go first. Well, <coughs> I, uh, <laughs> first of all, I think both Kino and I have extreme um, uh, solid reverence for Guruji, for Patabi Joyce, for his um, inventions and discoveries and carrying uh, the, the light of what yoga is, <coughs> yeah. uh, first of all. Um, and the people that we have both worked with, uh, of his students that is um, continuing that path is people that we have uh, an immense uh, respect for, such as, oh, first and foremost, Sharat, but also other people like uh, Tim Miller and uh, Richard Freeman and Lino Miele and Eddie Stern and, and a whole new level of people that is continuing that same uh, level 
like uh, David Robson in yeah. uh, Toronto, yeah. and uh, I could mention many more people here. Um, so there's that base level level where I, when I change something, when I do sometimes, and I, ch I change a little bit or uh, curve the the teaching a little bit to one side or the other, yeah. no doubt about it sometimes. I ask myself first, am I smarter than Patabi Joyce? Oh. Mm. It's like, why am I? Why do I think that I know better than him? Yeah. If he says this and I do this, I better, I better have a solid idea. So it's not just build an arrogance of the moment. Yeah. So that's that. Second of all, I think that uh, pursuing the tradition uh, in its um, more clear form, whatever that is. Um, gives a possibility to create a language and a grammar between the student and the teacher. It right. means that we instantly speak the same language and it takes a lot of questions out. It means that we can just both work on that thing. So it's not about what I'm saying to you. It's not about what you want to happen. So it, it we, we end up a place where there is the potential for very, very little confusion. Yeah. And is it and that I think is a very golden principle because most of the time in the world we never really know what's right and wrong but if we can agree upon we go there yeah Th that i think is uh, so extremely valid it takes many chitaritis out of the equation there so i think both you and i we start always with the traditional teaching <coughs> That's a whole other subject in itself, right? But uh, of how we interpret the uh, traditional uh, teaching, what we interpret the traditional teaching to be traditional as. Yeah. Um, we will go there and we will stay there for a solid period of time before we choose to go somewhere else. But don't get me wrong, I have taken people into second series that doesn't do uh, backdrops by themselves yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but after a lot of time, so you've tested it out first and you... Yes, yeah. there's some people that will probably never do second series. Yeah. And uh, if they have been sitting there and trying for two, three, four years, they have proven a lot to themselves and to me. They have really put in a lot of, of work. And at, at some times I have then taken them on. Mm. Uh, that's just one example. Yeah. Uh, but generally I prefer not to do that. I do that as an exception. I think that everybody is interested naturally in what they're good at yeah. and everybody is interested in avoiding things that we're bad at. Right. So we have mm. an attraction to pleasure and an aversion from pain. Mm. This yeah. is in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Mm. So if we take that attitude into our yoga practice, we're going to avoid the postures we don't like and we're yeah. going to do the postures we do like. So Ashtanga Yoga is humbling because you're not allowed to do that. You know, you get to a posture and it's difficult and you know what, there, you're asked to sit there until something shifts, until it changes, mm. until you put in the work. Yeah. And if it takes the rest of your life, it takes the rest of your life. So it's really humbling. So you might have someone who can do all these super advanced power moves. We had a student like that in the last course. He can do like handstands and one-arm handstands, but Sutta Kramasana is like, you know, maybe two years of practice, standing yeah. up from back fence. It was another two years of practice for him. Yeah. So in order for him to put in that work, he has to humble himself. The practice will humble him. Yeah. And like that, every posture that is your obstacle, it's an opportunity for you to be humbled, for the egoic mind, as Tim was talking about before, the ego is obstacle, for that to be broken slowly. So mm. it's really important that when you meet those obstacles, not necessarily you're going to do the posture perfectly, like a contortionist, like you're going to get the gold medal of the posture, but yeah. that you stay long enough for yourself to be humbled by the posture, so that you can let the light seep into your heart instead of, um, you know, just, just continuing to do what's comfortable for you, just continuing yeah. to do what's good for you, and instead surrendering into, um, you know, a, a, a plan that's maybe uh, bigger than your ego's desires. So could, is it something potentially... Yeah. Like I, so, yeah. I so agree. It's like Patanjali, he defines in his second sutra that uh, yoga happens in the mind. Mm. And that if we are trying to move into yoga as something that happens in the body, I think we have kind of lost the connection. We use the body to get into the mind. We use the body to get into the mind to get further on to soul or spirit or whatever you want to wanna call that. Um, and if we try to if we define our success in our practice on whether we catch the heels in Kapotasana or we do that jump back, then um, 
I think we misunderstood. I think the, fa the act of trying to catch the heels, and the act of trying to jump back, and all the stuff that comes up with that, whether I do it or I don't do it, all the stuff that comes up, that all my thought processes, all my uh, self-loathing, or all my self, yeah, I did it today, I'm a fantastic guy, or whatever it is, all that stuff gives us the possibility to get to know something about ourselves. Yeah. That's what I think it, it is. And if we start to skit on that, if we start to say, oh, I can't do this posture, I'll just do the next posture, then we um, take ourselves out of that equation, which is essentially the most important part of the practice. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Mm. It's just that maybe if I want to argue from a devil's advocate point of view, shall we say, yes. I might say that, okay, yoga lives within the sort of health and wellness sphere as well yeah. and maybe it's the only physical exercise that some people do yes so if they are and part of that yoga package is creating balance within the body to be mm. able to sit and to be able to have um yeah a, a certain calmness stillness of, of the mind for sure but also yes. a, a, a certain balance between the tension and certain muscles strength and certain muscles yes. and if we continually just, it's like would be going the, the equivalent of going into the gym and just doing bench presses or yes. just doing squats, yes. then we can quickly become uh, unbalanced okay. and maybe create more suffering potentially or, or potentials for pain. Yes. Um, so once, if we take yoga in that physical sphere, as an as an as an exercise, shall we say, which we're saying it it isn't, but it is used as an exercise mm. too. Then, uh, how can we accommodate people of their different types becoming creating some balance for them? Mm. Without you know, how how long do we hold them? Can we? Is that an issue, or should we just be saying, look, it isn't about exercise it mm. isn't about this it's about the mind so if you want to balance your body do it outside of the practice how should we approach it i think that the ashtanga yoga is not exercise mm. and i think it's pretty much a flawed idea to think that ashtanga yoga is an exercise mm. and if you think like that you're going to get yourself into oh i got to balance my body i got to throw in some back bends i got to do this i got to do that yeah. you approach it from that perspective you know, Sharad, Guruji, at any moment you can, they said, you know, at any moment you can take some asanas for health benefit. Right. At which point it's a completely different idea. Yeah. They've always defined the Ashtanga Yoga practice as a sadhana, a spiritual practice with a spiritual intention. So it's not an exercise. It has some exercise benefits, but that's a secondary thing. Yeah. If you want asana as a health benefit, like you want it to therapeutically treat tension in the body, therapeutically treat scoliosis, therapeutically treat osteoporosis, this sort of thing, you can design like yoga therapeutics and it can be approached that way, but but that's not the Ashtanga yoga method as yeah. Guruji and Sharat taught it. And I think it's really important to make that distinction. Um, you know, it's not a workout, right? Mm. So if you get work at worked out by a byproduct of it, that's great. I mean, I do a bunch of things outside of the practice that I think are good for my body physically, but I, I do my best not to, to, you know, make a clear delineation between those yeah. two because, you know, I've, I've really taken the words of my teachers to heart that the, the Ashtanga yoga practice is a sadhana, it's a spiritual practice. Yeah. So I don't, I think... So that clears up a lot of stuff. If you can yeah. approach it like that, yeah. then you know that if you're feeling you're more open in your hamstrings than you are in your quads or whatever, then you're yeah. going to have to do something on the side. Yeah, do it in yeah. the afternoon. If you feel yeah. you need balance in the body and the practice is not yeah. giving you that or you have a medical condition and some asanas relieve your medical condition or something like that, yeah. this is okay. This is for health benefit. But I think the confusion starts to be created when someone's like, oh, let me throw in these 10 asanas in the middle of the primary series because I think that feels really good for me. Then yeah. we start to get into that, I'm chasing my pleasure sort of yeah. thing rather than mm. just surrendering. Okay. Tim, okay. I can see something I, I, whirring around in your head there. Yeah, I'm not sure it's really taking form, but uh, <laughs> I agree with Kino. I am inspired by the sadhana aspect yeah. of this uh, practice. And the older I, I get, I'm 48, and the older I get, the old. yeah, I'm old. <laughs> so uh, we can probably touch you up in Photoshop. Thank you. That would be <laughs> the best thing. Maybe you can like spruce some intelligence. Yeah, we can take ten spruce. years off of you. Nick, get the Photoshop out. Is it one? Is it one? I am yeah. also in, interested in, in, in the sadhana aspect. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. 
And, yeah, and the older I get, the more interested I am in that, and the less I am in the physicality, actually. At least that's what I'm going through at the moment. Um, so I, th I think it's a, it's a big discussion about how to approach Ashtanga Yoga from the physical uh, only itself, which is really like the way that I came into it. That's what I was I got interested in. A lot of, so it's the same for a lot of people, isn't it? They are attracted by that physicalness yes. of the yes. practice. Yes, and but usually what happens, and that certainly happened for, for me, is like after a while something started else starting to happen, something I couldn't really explain, something on a more like emotional, mental level, and some emotional um, uh, responses that had like a resonance of what we would call a most like spiritual realm like started to form in me and when that happened then my whole physicality started to um, change I, I, I would I would argue uh, very much so <clears throat> and it became much more than my my physique having said that I did go through a uh, several years where I had back issues, so I had to go in and I uh, and use the practice as a physical therapy tool. Right. So I used it for that as, as physical therapy every day, and I asked myself every day on the mat: Is this yoga? Is this physical therapy? Is it ashtanga? Am I lazy? Am I being careful? Am I being mindful? Is this intelligent or is it just stupid what I'm doing? I, I literally couldn't figure it out. But I think it's an interesting, interesting uh, uh, talk, especially in, in the West, uh, yeah. East days. Thank you, guys. I mean, I could keep you talking <laughs> until tea time, you know. Mm. So, but um, thanks so much for spending the time with us, Thank and uh, just so much useful information. And it's been fantastic to practice with you both. Thank thanks. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.